What's up? I'm Alex Caminetti, and this is The Alternative Sound. In late April, early May of 1991, Flea, Anthony Kiedis, and John Frusciante moved into what would subsequently be dubbed The Mansion at 2451 Laurel Canyon Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. Chad Smith didn't stay in the house because it was haunted, but he said that he just wanted to stay at his own place and commute on his bike on the daily. The mansion studio situation was able to happen because Warner Brothers gave the Chili Peppers a significant budget to make their follow-up to Mother's Milk, and they enlisted Rick Rubin to produce it, who thusly hired Brendan O'Brien to engineer and mix. Rick and Brendan had a working relationship since 89, as Brendan worked on a bunch of albums for Rick's newly founded Deaf American label, now called American Recordings. Often thought to have been the home of Harry Houdini, Houdini actually never owned a house in Hollywood, but his friend Ralph Walker owned a house at 2400 Laurel Canyon, where Houdini and his wife stayed on occasion. The live room that was used on the album was a massive space. It was definitely wider than 30 feet, longer than 60 feet, and must have had at least 12 foot ceilings. Since the houses in California and sequoias were logged extensively until the late 60s, it could be assumed that the floors are sequoia. The walls are definitely plaster of Paris with a bunch of wall windows and wood molding. The main space was connected with glass doors that were kept open to a solarium with marble floors and a bunch of windows. Rugs can be seen in all of the spaces, as well as drapes covering a lot of the windows. There's also a baffle behind Chad, which is not uncommon when drums are positioned in the corner of a space like this. In this shot, you can see Chad situated in the corner of the solarium with the doors opened up. Aside from all the equipment and the techniques used, this space is what gives Blood Sugar its sound. In this shot, you can see John playing his 58 Sunburst Strat, which was the main guitar that he used on the album. This is his 57 fretless strat that he used to play the solo on Mellow Ship Slinky. He also used a 65 or 66 Jaguar throughout the album and a choral electric sitar on the title track. This is his 70s or 80s Les Paul reissue that he used a few times. And in this shot, you can see John holding his vintage Gibson lap steel that was used on the intro of Righteous and the Wicked. He didn't use too many effects pedals on this album, and you can see most of them in this shot. Left to right. John is plugging into an MXR Dynacomp compressor, which then goes into an Ibanez WH-10WA, and that possibly goes into a Boss DS-1. You can definitely see only three knobs on it. And then next to the headphones is likely the Boss DS-2 turbo distortion that he has used for quite some time. Next to the stage box is a DOD FX 65 stereo chorus. And in the bottom right of this, on top, it looks like an EHX poly chorus. And on the bottom looks to be a silver EHX Big Muff Pie. In this shot, although you can't exactly tell what the first two pedals are, you can definitely see that he's plugged into his Boss CE1 at the end of his pedal chain. This is also a good shot. If you look at the bottom right, you can see the DOD chorus with two outputs. And this is what is splitting his signal to go into both the super bass and the guitar amps that he uses. Also, if you look in front of the chair on the floor, you can see what I think is probably a 1960s Fender Reverb unit. It's tough to say what this is, but given the size of it, and the white knobs on top, I think that's probably what it is. In this shot from up high, you can see the amps that he used. On the left, on top of the 4x12, you can see on top a JMP 2204 that is on top of a JMP Super Bass. The DOD chorus, or the Boss CE1, is used to split his signal between his guitar amps and his bass amp. The bass amp he uses for punch and low end and the guitar amps he uses for edge. Throughout this album, you can hear the super bass on one side, typically the left, and the guitar amps cranked on the right side. Sometimes they're combined. Oftentimes, he just goes direct into the board. In the dissection videos to follow, I am going to point out all the times that he went DI and all the times that he used both amps or combined them into one. 
In this shot, you can see him playing into an MXR Dyna comp for the solo of Mellow Ship Slinky. And behind him, you can also see a fuzz face that was used at some point, or maybe it wasn't at all. And notice that the cabs are not mic'd. That's because he had two cabs in the live room for when they jammed and two cabs mic'd in isolation. This is also a good shot of the amps that he used on the whole album. This is John playing a Maton 12 string without 12 strings on it. This was used on Breaking the Girl, and it was used as a 12 string at the end of I Could Have Lied. And lastly, in this shot, you can see next to Chad, the Fender Hot practice amp that John used to play a bunch of solos, uh, like on Suck My Kiss, and I Could Have Lied. This is one of the only shots of his new Martin D18, which you can tell it's a D18 due to the black binding. Throughout this whole album, Flea used a wall bass MK2 four string, and that's what gave him, you know, that really unique, gritty, punchy tone. He also used a Music Man Stingray five string on Funky Monks and The Righteous and the Wicked. In this shot, you can see Flea plugged into one of many of his Galleon Kruger 800 RBs. He was using Mesa cabs at the time, and in this shot you can see a 2x10 and either a 1x15 or a 2x15. These were used in isolation. Jumping into the control room real quick, we can see Flea playing bass to give it away, and this is just going straight into the board via DI but it's no doubt also sent to his amps and cabs. The only pedals that Flea used on the album was a vintage Mutron 3 envelope filter on the Power of Equality and Sir Psycho Sexy, and an EHX polychorus on the verses of Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Everything else was direct into his amps, and in this shot you can see two of his GK800s next to him. This is Chad playing his Gretsch kit four toms and an unported kick. The snare was a 70s 5-inch Black Beauty owned by Ross Garfield, tuned super high, and he also used his old Tama brass bell at some point. So much of the sound of this album is Chad Smith's playing, his kit, and this legendary massive space in the mansion. Chad was using mostly Zildjian and pasty cymbals, and left to right, a 20-inch pasty signature heavy china, a 22-inch pasty signature dry heavy ride, a 20-inch K Zildjian crash, a splash, an 18-inch pasty signature full crash, another splash, a 16-inch pasty signature full crash, and 14-inch K Zildjian hats, and another splash. You can also see a tambourine, but I don't know if this was actually hit. Okay, moving on to the last instruments used on the album. This is Flea playing a Yamaha Grand Piano. This was used on a bunch of tracks during the sessions. This is Flea playing two toy pianos and trumpet on Apache Rose Peacock. And this is Chad Smith playing two pasty crashes on Soul to Squeeze. And this is the band playing scrap metal in the bridge of Breaking the Girl. This is the Micro Moog that was used on If You Have to Ask and the title track as well. It actually isn't shown at any point, but Brendan O'Brien played Mellotron on Breaking the Girl and Sir Psycho Sexy. Brendan also played a Hammond B3 into a 122, which you can tell it's a 122 and not a 147 because of the way it speeds up and slows down. A 147 would be way faster. He plays this on Suck My Kiss under the bridge, and soul to squeeze. Brendan also played the marimba on Mellow Ship Slinky and Sir Psycho Sexy. Aside from tambourine on most of the album, and some shaker and aux percussion, and Juice Heart played by Pete Weiss on Give It Away, that is all of the instruments used on the album. Moving into the control room now to look at the equipment that was used to actually make the album. Let's dig in. Behind Anthony and Rick in the shot, you can see what is no doubt a Neve modular console, and I think it's an 8026. Let's take a look at these Neve modules to see what they could be. These are Neve modules, 1066, 1073, 1084. Since this is in black and white, we can basically see what knobs are on the modules by what is reflecting light. With the light, 
in the room, the red knob, which is the gain on top, would not be reflecting. In this shot, you can clearly see there's only two white knobs reflecting, leading me to believe that the only thing reflecting are the middle two silver outer rings that select the frequency, along with the bottom two EQ and phase buttons. So I think that the whole console is loaded with either 1066s or 1073s. Over Rick's left shoulder, you can see eight modules, two blank spaces, and then another two modules. Jumping to the opposite end of the console, on top of the console, we can see four channels of Neve 31105 preamps, EQs, ripped out of the legendary Neve 8078 console, one of the most legendary consoles of all time. This is what a rack of eight Neve 31105s looks like. And then in the console, to the right of his arm, we can see three channels of 1073. He moves his arm slightly, and you can see another two channels of 1073 with two blank spaces to the left of it. He moves his arm again, and then to the left of those two blank spaces, you see one more channel of 1073. All of these preamps have EQs on them. Since Brendan O'Brien often prints EQ to tape, I have no doubt these EQs were heavily used in both tracking and mixing. And all of these preamps went into a Studer A80 MK4 tape machine. You can see the remote to the Studer A80 next to Brendan in this shot. This is the remote to the A80, and this is the VU bridge. Behind Fleet in this shot, you can see a Sony 57ES DAP machine used in the early 90s as what was referred to as a safety mix. So a lot of the stuff, while it was mixed to tape, it was also split off and recorded to digital tape in case the tape failed. It could also be a Sony TC cassette recorder, which would have just been used to make mixes to listen to during the sessions. In between the preamps and tape machine, there is a bunch of analog equipment used not only to print the tracks to tape, but also while mixing. Let's dig into it. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please behold the culmination of decades of audio technology development? There's a lot to go over in this, so we're just gonna do it bit by bit. Starting at the left, behind Chad Smith, you can see the remote control to the Studer A80. You can tell that this is a modular controller and both sides are switched. You can see a bunch of buttons and faders behind Chad. I think this is a LaFont Audio Labs FTC 84 transfer console. This would have been used by Gavin Bowden so that he could have a mix from the console specifically recorded for his film. Now, starting at the top, they used a bunch of DBX 160 VU compressors. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have absolutely no idea what this is. If I had to guess, it's some kind of dual EQ or compressor, but I have no idea. This, I believe, is a DBX 463X noise gate, and this is one of the classics in 1176 Silverface limiting amplifier. I don't know what this is, and I think this is another DBX 463X noise gate, and below that, I think, is a DBX 165A compressor. Up top, we have two Poltec EQP 1A3 tube EQs. This 1U rack space is often not lit up, so I don't even know if it was used, and if it was, I don't know what it is. Underneath that, we have six racks and 24 channels of DBX 363X gates. There's two gates per unit, and two units fit in each rack meaning that each track of the 24 tracks of the tape machine could be gated, even though you always lose the last track to Simpty for automation. Below the DBX gates, this is a late 60s Teletronics LA-2A optical leveling amplifier, and this is the successor to Teletronics original LA-2. You can tell that this is an LA-2 because of the larger VU meter 
as opposed to the smaller one on the LA-2A. In the middle is the late 60s LA-2A, and on the bottom is the original LA-2. I think to the left of the 160s might be the Lexicon 480L, and below it I think there might be a bunch of 463Xs or 160X compressors, but I have no idea. In this shot, you can see the Lexicon 480L Lark remote, the VU meters of the Studer A80, as well as the Yamaha NS10 monitors that were used while tracking and mixing. This is an Eventide H3000 Ultra Harmonizer. Above the patch bay, you can see the H3000. I believe that this was used on the Moog in Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and it could have been used as a delay unit throughout the album as well when the 480L was being used on other tracks, since it's only a two-channel unit. This is the Neve console that was used as a monitoring board, as well as, I believe, to mix. It is a Neve 8128 with GML 8402 flying faders. You can tell that it's a Neve because of the talkback mic, as can be seen in this photo. It is quite clearly a Neve talkback mic, and since it has plasma meters, it can only be a handful of Neve consoles. And the little mini bus faders seen in this photo give it away as in 8128. Due to the black fader modules, the silver faders, and the square light at the top of each, I believe it is GML automation. More specifically, the GML 8402 that was released in 1989. Now let's look at what mics were used. You can clearly see in this three U87s as overheads. And these are going, I believe, into Neve 31105. In this shot, way up high behind the guitar amps, you can see the room mic. This is a Neumann U87 as well, either in Omni or Figure 8, that was compressed and gated, used as basically a snare reverb on the entire album. I also believe that the U87 room mic went into Neve 31105, which finishes out the four channels they had during tracking for a consistent drum sound. On the left, there's a KM84 on the snare, and on the right, there's an SM57 combined into one channel on the console and printed to one track on tape, an SM57 on the kick. The toms are all mic'd up with Sennheiser 421s. Hi-hat looks to be a KM84, and under the rack tom is clearly a Neumann U47. All of these mics are going into 1073. The 31105s on the overheads and the room mic give a high mid punch and grit that you wouldn't get from 1073s as overheads, while the 1073s on the kick and snare give you the low end body and punch and a smoother high end. Since Brennan O'Brien is known to EQ drums to tape, I believe that he used these Poltex on the album for the kick and the snare meaning the kick was mic'd with a 57 that went into Neve 1073, that went into Poltec EQP 1A3, and snare was mic'd with a KM84 that went into Neve 1073, that went into Poltec EQP 1A3. Brendan probably hit the tape harder with the kick and snare than the rest of the kit, so that the tape could compress the EQ signals, which were then EQ'd with 31105s, compressed with 160s, and gated with 363Xs while mixing. I'd also like to point out that most of these mics were not used. The only mics that actually ended up being used on the album were the three overheads, the snare, the kick, and the room mic. Everything else was replaced. Since there isn't actually an image of the mics used on the guitar amps and the bass amp, I think given what was used on most of the album, it was either an SM57, a U87. Brendan often used KM86s on guitar amps throughout most of his productions in the 90s. It could have been that, but it's tough to say because the cabs were in isolation, so there's really no way to know. In this shot of Flea playing toy pianos on Apache Rose Peacock, you can see the U87 that was set up in front of his bass cab 
and at one point in Apache Rose Peacock, you can actually hear some bass in the room mic. I will get to that in the dissection of Apache Rose, but it's worth pointing out because it could have been used on the bass cab during overdubs. Throughout this entire album, Anthony Kita sang into a Shure SM7, and SM7s have two settings on them, a bass roll-off and a mid boost. The bass roll-off was not used, it was left flat. And you can hear that on most of the album because anytime he says Bs, there's a lot of bass to them. You can also see that Brendan used the mid boost, which is also common while using this mic on vocals. It just lets the vocals cut through the mix a little bit easier, and then you have to use less EQ down the line. The vocals were no doubt sent into 1073, which was then sent into Teletronics LA-2A, which smooths it out because it has a slow attack and a fast release, which in audio talk just smooths it out before it hits a faster compressor like the DBX 160 or 1176. I believe that the intro vocals on Under the Bridge was the only time that the U87 was used on his lead vocals, but then as soon as it kicks into the verse and the rest of the song, it goes back to the SM7. This is Anthony singing into what looks to be an SM58 with a windscreen on it because they were playing outside. This was the only time on the album that this was used, and it was just because they were recording outside. Still into 1073, no doubt. So basically, the whole album was made with six mics on the kit, two guitar amp mics, a guitar DI, one bass mic, a bass DI, and a vocal mic. 12 channels, ladies and gentlemen. Multi-platinum album. 12 channels. And on top of all of that, most of the tracks were played live. This is Flea and John singing into a U87. Most of the backup vocals, as I will get into in the dissection videos, even though it looks like they're singing simultaneously, a lot of these tracks ended up being sang independently. This is John really digging in during Breaking the Girl. You can see him clearly playing into a Sennheiser 441. Off to the side, you can see what looks to be in AKG 451 EB that was no doubt used when a more upfront sound was needed. This is the grand piano mic'd up with two AKG 414 BULSs. These are no doubt going into 1073 and being summed into one channel and being printed to one channel on tape. And even though we can't see it, I have to believe that the Hammond was mic'd up with either 87s or 57s, two of them summed into one and printed to one channel. This is most apparent on Suck My Kiss because the Hammond is so intense and it definitely sounds like the high and low rotors are combined into one. Again, I'll get into that in the dissection videos. This is John Frusciante's mom, Gail, and her church friends singing the backup vocals in Under the Bridge. This ended up being two tracks, one vibrato and one choir vocals. And to the right of John's knee, you can see what looks to be a 70s Fender bassman. What isn't shown in any of the footage, Mellotron, Marimba, Hammond, and tambourine. Also, an unknown mic taped to a mic stand while the Chili Peppers bang on scrap metal during the bridge of Breaking the Girl. I have no idea what mic this is. Most of all these tracks are totally clean, just EQ'd to tape and then compressed while mixing. Some of the stuff was no doubt compressed to tape, but the way that the album sounds, which is very much not at all compressed, I have to believe that the compression to tape was fairly minimal. All the same equipment was used while mixing. The only thing that was added was 12 channels of Neve 31105, bringing the total channel count to 16, and basically turning the console into a hybrid 8078, 8026. These were used because the EQ is way more flexible than 1073 EQs while mixing, and they've been used on countless albums. So while mixing, basically everything in the space was used. The racks of DBX 160s, the Poltec EQs, all the gates, the H3000 multi-effects, the 480L was used on the vocals extensively. And while a lot of people think that the vocals on the album are really dry, as you will see in the dissection videos, there is processing on the vocals on basically every song. It's minimal, but the 480L, the Lexicon 480L, 
is on the vocals on mostly every song. Sometimes it was used as a reverb unit on background vocals, but most of the time it was just used as a lead vocal delay. And I also think that Anthony's backup vocals in Funky Monks, Sir Psycho Sexy, the second half, and the greeting song, you know, the telephone effect that's often used. I think that was made by plugging his mic into Neve 1073 and then sending that into this 1176 to compress it and then sending that into the EQP 1A3 to filter it. I also believe that the room mic that was used throughout the whole album, the U87 that was either an Omni or figure eight, was sent into 31105 into 1176 to compress it and then gated with the 363X that was keyed with the snare. And by that, I mean every time the snare hit, it would open up the room mic to give it an explosive sound, and you can hear this throughout the whole album. A lot of people have a negative association of gated reverbs with 80s music because it was used with really shitty early digital reverbs. But if you use the technique with a more natural sounding reverb or a room mic, it actually sounds super awesome. Lastly, the whole album was mixed with automation because there's just too much going on in each mix with things coming up and going down. I just can't believe that was mixed by hand. So. There's only two options. One, that the Neve console had Martin Sound flying faders on it, which is possible because you do see lights at the top of the faders sometimes, and there's not much footage of them mixing anyways, so the automation wouldn't be engaged. But I think they just mixed on the 8128 with the GML automation. My wife has repeatedly accentuated to me that all of my idols did not act alone, as they were supported by myriad people and institutions who gave them the opportunity and privilege of pursuing art, and thus allowed them to create and perfect artistic masterpieces with great cultural importance. To focus just on the resulting product and not the people and institutions who supported them and allowed them to do it in the first place would be unnecessarily perpetuating the concept that we all just act alone and can do everything on our own, which is obviously and completely incorrect. For this music to have been made, received, if you will, from wherever music comes, there are many people and companies who supported Flea, Anthony, John, and Chad and allowed them to make this album to begin with. They had someone running errands for them on the daily. They had Livin' Cooks, Lindy, their manager. They had the support of their friends and family. River Phoenix showed up to the house a bunch. Flea's daughter Clara was at the house a bunch. And if you have a child like I do, you no doubt know that children give you insane amounts of inspiration. And the inspiration from his child, Clara, no doubt helped heal his recent separation as well as helped fuel the inspirational vibe of the album. And last but most definitely not least, the collaboration between Rick Rubin as a producer and the Red Hot Chili Peppers as a band was absolutely critical in the development not just of this album, but the modern Chili Pepper sound as we know it. So that is how Blood Sugar Sex Magic was made by the Red Hot Chili Peppers with Rick Rubin producing, Brandon O'Brien engineering and mixing. And John and Flea say that there is recordings of ghosts on the album that only they can hear. I believe it. A bunch of other songs were recorded during the sessions. A cover of Seek and Destroy, a cover of Castles Made of Sand, two originals called Sick and Mechanico and Fellas Cock. Excellent titles. Sold a squeeze that was eventually released on the Conehead soundtrack. And there's a bunch of jams that unfortunately never saw the light of day. So that does it. I'm Alex Caminetti, and this is the Alternative Sound. See you next time.